Hello, my name is David Toman and I welcome you to the next episode of European Values Perspectives, where we invite experts from security and foreign policy fields. My special guests today are uh, Tsuneo Watanabe from Sasakawa Peace Foundation and uh, Willem Semerak from Charles University. Watanabe san's expertise includes security in Asia and Europe. Professor Semerak focuses, among other things, on international trade and Chinese economy. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. And it's a uh, great honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation too. On February 4th of 2022, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin met with uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping at the opening of the Winter Olympics in Beijing. They produced a joint statement that the friendship between their countries has no limits. And just four days after the Olympics had ended, Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The attention of the world then quickly shifted towards the Taiwan Strait, as China has been intensifying its pressure on Taiwan, which it considers to be part of its territory. Therefore, in today's episode, we will focus on the topic of regional tensions and uh, economic security. Let's start with Ukraine. What is the biggest lesson from the war in terms of its economic impact on uh, European countries and Japan? Watanabe-san, uh, may I ask you to start? All right. Um, you know, the the impact of uh, Ukraine oh, is uh, so many things to the, the, the Japan's the perception, um, including, uh, of course, more security issue, but uh, I'd like to focus on the more economic Im- impact. Um, you know, the Japan is a still that depends on uh, uh, the mo- almost a hundred percent of uh, ga- gas and oil outside of Japan, and uh, the the major, mainly it's coming from uh, Middle East and the Gulf state, but uh, the, partly it's coming from Russia. So this thing, this uh, part, uh, somehow the sharing with uh, the some European nations too. So. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the no guarantee for the flow of energy. That's now the European are learning and the we are learning too. And uh, in case of uh, some uh, contingency in the Taiwan Strait, I think uh, that's serious trouble for the, 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 the energy flow from uh, the Middle East and the Gulf State to Japan. I think uh, that's possible to happen. And... Uh, you know, the, I, I, another way to say is a uh, uh, geopolitical impact is uh, mo- very serious to the Japan's survival and uh, economic growth. I think that's a big lesson we are learning. Mm-hmm. Thank you, uh, Professor Semerak. Uh, what is uh, your opinion? I, I guess there are several lessons and several, I could say, gentle reminders of facts that we all knew about, but that we perhaps didn't take so seriously. So the biggest lesson is pretty general. That means that it's not that uh, uh, useful or it's pretty dangerous to become dependent on an authoritarian country. So we have all previously assumed that the mutual benefits uh, arising from international trade will mean that any such dependencies will also discourage that other potentially rogue country from from causing troubles. But we have been reminded that this is not the case, that such countries can reduce their sensitivity to, to economic pressures and therefore they don't necessarily care about immediate economic threats. Second very important issue that we significantly underestimated even in some of our estimates was the effects of the crisis on commodity prices. When we look at the volume and value of imports from the EU, Uh, from Russia to the EU, that in spite of the fact that we were trying to hit Russia with sanctions, in fact, the value of imports to quite a few of the countries skyrocketed because of the initial effect of the crisis on oil and gas prices. And perhaps uh, last but not least, it reminded us that we should not forget in future that there are also other countries than us, that means the rest of the world, uh, primarily for the future crises, it will be important to 
anticipate what crisis can happen and maybe build up a stronger support in non-aligned countries, especially the countries where currently China has been trying to build up strong support and spread its soft power. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, Watanabe-san, uh, how was the Japanese economy and society impacted by the war in Ukraine? And how did the Japanese government uh, respond uh, to this challenge? Uh, first of all, uh, I think uh, the Ukraine war doesn't have a direct impact to the Japanese economy. And uh, but, uh, I think an uh, indirect uh, effect is uh, several things, like uh, the high price of uh, energy, that's really impacting Japanese uh, domestic economy. I think, uh, you know, price for the electricity is uh, skyrocketing now. Um, so because uh, Japan uh, were lucky somehow get used to the very low stable price for the electricity. However, now many people starting to complain about uh, high prices. That's clearly the impact of uh, the war in the Ukraine because the uh, world energy market is uh, really now the somehow the, the uh, causing a high tendency of uh, energy price. And uh, again, Japan is heavily depends on uh, the energy flow outside of Japan. And Japan doesn't have, unfortunately, uh, almost no uh, our own uh, natural resources uh, f- for the energy. So I think uh, that's one thing. But uh, at the same time, uh, another trouble may come too. Um, you know, the, the Japan is heavily depends on the trade with China. So that's professor already suggested that, that we cannot count on the authoritarian uh, countries, but uh, actually the, what we are doing is that we are heavily dependent on the trade with China. I think uh, that's probably the, the, the big trouble for Japan in the future. Um, it's now too. I think uh, uh, recently Japanese foreign minister Hayashi visited China to talk with uh, he, his counterpart. The reason is simply the, the the one reason is that try to ease the tension between Japan and China. But also, you know, the Japanese businessman in China is now detained as a suspect sus, suspicion uh, suspicion of uh, uh, spying. So uh, now Japanese are. Uh, well, the uh, foreign minister is asking counterpart to release it because. Uh, Uh, that's not the case, the spying. Actually, the, in the Japanese government uh, doesn't have uh, any official espionage activity uh, after World War II. That's weakness of Japan. But, uh, you know, clearly the Japan is uh, upset to the China is uh, taking a kind of a hostage of a Japanese businessmen. So long-term impact. Again, uh, the business with uh, China Well, business is an authoritarian state. Is uh, probably we have to uh, the rethink about it. That Japan is now learning a lesson. But you know, again, the Jap- Japan's economy is still uh, the link closely linked with the uh, Chinese economy. So it's a very difficult to what kind of a uh, uh, decoupling. That's it. A partial de- decoupling is uh, possible, and uh, how. Uh, the making uh, the impact to, uh, to the J- Japanese domestic economy that as small as possible. So we are being tested seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you for your remarks. And uh, Professor uh, Samerak, a similar question goes to you compared to what we just uh, heard from uh, Watanabe-san. How was the Czech economy impacted uh, by the conflict and what can we learn from it? Well, obviously, given our proximity or much closer proximity to the conflict, uh, we have been afflicted in many different ways compared to Japan. So the first channel was obviously similar. Those would be significantly increased prices of inputs, especially of commodity prices. In our case, it was made even more complicated by a kind of confluence with the effects of previous monetary policies, some kind of fiscal pressures, as well as with changing Uh, energy policies in Europe. So the timing of that was 
quite troublesome, but it seems that Czech economy is actually doing fairly well with that, surprisingly well. Second channel could be the effects on exports. Fortunately, in spite of many previous attempts to increase the role of the Commonwealth of Independent States, the share in our exports remained relatively, relatively small. So the about, if we compare the uh, year 2022 with the previous year, uh, about, uh, I think, 40% drop in our year-to-year -year trade with Russia as far as exports are concerned. That is not, nothing that would have that would lead to bigger dangers than possible problems for individual companies or individual sectors. So it doesn't have that high economy-wide effect. But then there were also some additional issues that we haven't anticipated, for which we are not that much ready. So the inflow of refugees, which obviously in the short run uh, mean pressure on our education se sector, pressure on our fiscal space, but on the other hand also an opportunity because we have been struggling with, uh, with the lack of available labor in some sectors and obviously we are having some problems with getting skilled labor to some sectors, so it's also a blessing in disguise. And last but not least, I've touched a few times fiscal issues. So in the short term, definitely this has contributed negatively to fiscal pressures. So increased expenditures, the perspective of even higher expenditures uh, in future because of the need to invest into our defense capacities, combined with increased uh, current expenditures linked to higher pensions, uh, higher unemployment benefits and other inflation related type of payments. Uh, given what we know about the war in Ukraine, uh, how can we prepare our economies for a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan? And how can we predict uh, the potential consequences? And uh, do you think that it's even possible that uh, the invasion could uh, take place uh, given the current situation in the world, uh, Watanabe san? What uh, Japan and the United States and uh, like-minded nations uh, try to do is, uh, the, first of all, probably the, the don't give a chance uh, for to China to go some military adventurism. That that's one of the reason that the very recent uh, um, U.S. Initi initiative for the try to restrict uh, the high-spec uh, semiconductors uh, import to China. So um, the Japan does not uh, produce, uh, I think, a uh, high-spec high of uh, semiconductors, but uh, Japan and Australia has a company who can manufacture, uh, I mean, uh, produce a manufacture, manufacturing machine for the high-spec uh, semiconductor. So um, I think uh, it seems to me uh, the Japan, United States, and uh, uh, the Dutch agreed to some restriction or the the exporting uh, the high spec uh, semiconductor manufacturing machine too. So this is one thing we 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 try to somehow the restrict our own uh, export to China, but uh, at the same time uh, we don't want. To fully cut uh, the economy. That, that's impossible too. So uh, what, uh, uh, however, uh, we try to do is, uh, um, you know, don't depend on uh, China too much. That means that the revi revision uh, supply chain of a manufacturing. So in case of China try to stop some critical material, uh, probably the, we should uh, uh, prepare for the alternative uh, other than uh, China. Um, Japan experienced, uh, uh, I think, uh, already. Uh, when uh, Japan and uh, China had a, a serious tension over uh, Senkaku Islands, that's Japan's territory, but uh, China uh, claimed uh, over the uh, Japan's uh, uh, claim over the, their own the territory. And the Japanese government decided to purchase that island because uh, individual owner, that Japanese individu individual owner uh, tried to sell it. And after Japan, Japanese government decided to purchase that. Uh, China did uh, several kind of uh, the countermeasures. One of them is a stop uh, rare earth uh, to Japan. So that was uh, somehow the surprising 
Uh, because uh, nowadays people are not so surprised to the, the China is uh, doing some restriction of uh, material in the purpose of uh, uh, political uh, intention. At that time, Japan experienced the very, very first time. It's earlier. Um, uh, luckily, uh, somehow the, uh, that, that was not so serious trouble for Japan. However, I think uh, now Jap- Japan and other countries are realizing to re- re- revise uh, uh, total uh, the, uh, the supply chain, which cannot be dependent on authoritarian country and uh, try to create our own uh, somehow the secure the supply chain. Well, easy to say, but sometimes uh, very difficult to practice because uh, sometimes uh, that is uh, more costly than before. So unfortunately, or I think sometimes uh, the, the Chinese product is uh, cheaper. And sometimes the authoritarian regimes, uh, the product is uh, cheaper because they don't um, seriously taking care of human rights or environment. So we really need to think about it, uh, not only one country, but with uh, the in- international community, how to secure our own uh, uh, the supply chain without sacrificing a basic principle of a free trade and free economy. Hmm, thank you. Um, Professor uh, Semerak, uh, what is your perspective? And of course, you can also uh, take advantage of your expertise and uh, include in your answer uh, input and output uh, analysis and other models that we can use to, pre- to predict potential uh, consequences of such conflict. Well, firstly, your original question was so broad that we could have a whole conference focused on that. So I apologize if I answer only maybe 5% of that. <laughs> no problem. But on both levels, which I identify there, that means whether there would be a conflict and how to prepare for that, I think that you can, at least these days, can, uh, can find a whole range of answers. But the spectrums gradually, in the case of the first question, that means the probability of the conflict, seem to be turning red. That means towards the more critical types of opinions especially during the last months, actually since our uh, discussion over the topic, there have been, I think, at least four speeches by President Xi Jinping and additional steps taken by Chinese government in terms of preparing for preparing mobilization offices, changing the rules which can be applied uh, either during the future occupation of Taiwan or on Chinese nationals who might express some disagreement with, with such uh, measures. So this kind of uh, indicates that At the very least, we should be taking that seriously, even if, as many people still remind us, until fairly recently, it would have appeared to be much more pragmatic and much more logical for China simply to wait and build up peaceful relations. It simply seems that um, the current generation of Chinese leaders sees the world uh, through much more ideological perspective, and they are not that much willing to wait any longer. Perhaps possibly they are even overestimating the, their global role and misunderstanding what, what can happen. About preparing uh, that stuff, obviously it would seem logical to do what the United States have proposed already some eight, nine years ago. That means to start a decoupling. Uh, purely technocratically, we have mentioned the input-output table, so we can identify where China contributes, where maybe Taiwan, which would be threatened, that would be also the type of flow threatened by the war, where Taiwan contributes to global value chains and we can try to work on some kind of work around replacement. You can try to search new suppliers. For instance, lots of Japanese companies as well as companies from other countries are now uh, focusing on transfer of some of their capacities to Taiwan, Thailand, sorry, uh, to Vietnam and Thailand. Especially Vietnam has been booming, booming incredibly in the past few years thanks to a similar effect. Saying this, the situation is unfortunately not, not so simple. Firstly, we have got companies in Western countries as well as in Japan and even in Taiwan, which are directly or indirectly under Chinese influence. And we are not quite sure how they are going to behave. Uh, secondly, many of our uh, sources of data, like the input-output tables or data that we are using for complex models, like the CGE model of go- um, global economy called GTEP, they're actually not that detailed. So it's not that easy to track individual influential commodities. So there is always a significant danger of error or of misunderstanding of what is going on in global economy. Quite frankly, 
Even many trade economists were caught by surprise by some of the events of the last years, so the sudden revealed sensitivities to some types of microchips or some of the bottlenecks in a so specific supply chains as uh, individual hygienic protection and protective, uh, protective products that we were all relying upon during COVID times. Even more importantly, uh, I've recently seen a very interesting presentation uh, by Professor Inomata, also from Japan. Uh, he's, I think he works for Jetro. And he developed a very nice alternative set of indicators, which is looking at path through frequencies. So compared to the, our older view, where we are looking at the relative value of contributions of different countries to the supply chain, he's also looking at approximately how many times a kind of party, a kind of supply chain uh, touches some Chinese suppliers or passes through Chinese uh, sectors or China controlled sectors of economy. And uh, the data actually show that maybe our sensitivity to China can be slightly higher in some sectors and significantly higher in other sectors than we originally assumed. And even more importantly, actually added additional level to this analysis, he was trying to look at possible probability of replacement uh, of some of these dependencies with like-minded countries and got very interesting results uh, that in some cases it may not be that easy. When we are going to replace China, we are not necessarily going to find like-minded countries, but there are countries which are somewhere in the middle between us and China, not necessarily being that much aligned with our view of the world either. And often countries which in the past few years were collaborating intensively with China. So uh, what we should perhaps work on Besides mapping these supply chains, on this I completely agree that we actually need to combine all the new wealth of big data with our existing methodology, and we should try to be we should try to map the supply chains at much greater level of detail than before. But obviously, we should be aware that the other party does it too. Uh, we should actually work on the unity of Western countries. So we should try to make sure that the EU will stand as really one voice. So far, we see that even in the case of Ukraine, there is occasional uh, hesitation by some of the countries, mm -hmm. if I say it very politely. Sure. Uh, that will include, obviously, having some wider consensus of the West. Uh, and when we are sure about this, we need to work on the non-aligned countries. Because when we are looking at the supply chains, it's not only us de being dependent on China, but there are somewhere in the middle countries like Congo and others, which are supplying important inputs to either China or to us or to Taiwan or to Japan. And we need to keep reasonable relations with them too. I think that despite the question being so broad, you both managed to, to answer uh, sufficiently. Thank you. And... Um... Uh, my next question is, uh, how would the economic impact of the Taiwan war uh, differ from uh, the Ukrainian case? We have already discussed uh, the consequences uh, of the war in Ukraine on the Czech Republic or on the EU and on Japan, uh, with uh, uh, the Czech Republic and, Jap uh, and uh, Europe being uh, affected uh, directly, uh, Japan rather indirectly. Could we expect that in case of a Taiwan war, this would uh, shift? Or uh, are there some differences that we should pay attention to? Uh, Watanabe-san? I think uh, the Taiwan contingency, Taiwan, war in Taiwan, is uh, the real, the big nightmare for Japan, of course. That means that Japan is, uh, would be the very directly involved in uh, the war activity. And uh, uh, that, that's probably, I don't know, uh, can compare to the uh, Poland next to Ukraine. Poland. But, you know, uh, I think uh, the situation is a little bit more complicated because uh, uh, Poland doesn't have any heavily depends on some uh, the, their, the, their communication route. Is, is is not prohibited by the Ukraine because the Poland side was uh, the European side was uh, free open. So, but Japan's case, not really. The reason is uh, simple, simply the, the location, uh, sea lane of uh, Japan's uh, the the uh, serious the uh, critical co communication line was uh, cannot be avoided by the the water near. Taiwan, of course, possible to make a big detour, make a big, 
big detour means uh, the more cost for the, the, the transportation. So that's big trouble for the economically. And also, um, also the, the world impact is uh, the supply of a semiconductor. If, if a Taiwan is uh, in trouble, um, j- worldwide uh, is uh, losing uh, the very important and critical supply of uh, the, the, you know, the high, 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 high spec semiconductor too. So, um, you know, the, that's the temporary Japan and uh, world experience uh, uh, before when uh, the earthquake hit Taiwan. And uh, at that time, uh, the supply of a semiconductor was uh, really troubled in the world. But, you know, uh, uh, even the earthquake was uh, the, the, such an impact, but uh, the, in case of a contingency, we cannot uh, uh, calculate how long it would take. And that's big uh, impact to the world economy and the Japan's economy too. And the Japan's on uh, uh, survival is a really trouble. And um, again, uh, I, I don't want to think about it, but uh, in case of a Taiwan contingency and if the U.S. involved in, clearly U.S. Uh, is uh, somehow the uh, very strong, uh, serious tension with uh, China. And as a ally of the United States, Japan uh, is expected to assist the U.S. and the Japan would do. That case, uh, for example, now one Japanese businessman is uh, somehow uh, the, uh, the issue. Um, not only one, but now I think 17 Japanese, Japanese businessmen in China is uh, in, in, in the custody. I don't know the exact number, but uh, more than 10. But, you know, uh, in case of uh, if the uh, U.S. has uh, uh, the, some war situation with China, how many Japanese in China uh, have a trouble? Or how many Chinese uh, nationals in Japan has a trouble? Um, you know, the, any case of very the, uh, the hu- formidable damage to the not only economy, but the uh, whole security or society, human, human lives. I think uh, uh, that's probably the, I cannot answer exactly what is a trouble, but I, what I'm sure is a big, huge trouble we never experienced before. Thank you, Professor uh, Samarak. So it's a very interesting, but of course, tragical set of scenarios that we can discuss here. Uh, some differences would be obvious given given the distance and differences. It's extremely unlikely that we will be facing the inflow of refugees from Taiwan, in spite of the fact of this being probably something that the Czech economy would would be able to use efficiently. But more importantly, we should start with discussing how this will actually evolve. What we can expect, at the very least, it will either start or continue with a kind of naval blockade, plus additional restrictions. Uh, on air traffic between between Taiwan and the rest of the world, uh, then uh, the next stage perhaps would be uh, the danger of d- destruction of Taiwanese production capacities. Uh, although we can expect that at least initially China might be attempting similar policies as Russia and Ukraine, hoping that they would get that they will be able to capture such capacities, they can perhaps avoid the immediate destruction. But uh, at least in the short and medium run we should expect that there will be interruptions of the flows by which Taiwan is contributing to global supply chains. For us, this will mean a pretty different situation compared to one that we are facing right now. In the case of the dependence on Russia, there were many direct flows. With Taiwan, many of our uh, critical linkages are rather indirect. So uh, the Taiwanese produce microchips, which are then assembled in Vietnam or other countries or in China into finalized products, which are then exported to Eastern Europe. And we are dependent on them because we cannot produce some of these inputs directly. So uh, there will not be that much of direct loss of trade, perhaps, but indirectly we will be facing shortages of key components, shortages of uh, of uh, products and services which are dependent somewhere down in their downstream, sorry, somewhere upstream uh, channels on uh, inputs from Taiwan. 
What will also be different or what might be different might be the power of China to introduce additional additional troubles to global economy in the form of what we could perhaps best call extraterritorial application of sanctions. So the much greater cloud of Chinese economy, the fact that there are more countries which don't want to alienate China than countries which are really worried about Russian response unless they are directly dependent on their gas and oil, can mean that for European countries uh, it can be much more difficult to help Taiwan and it can be facing the, uh, the risk of secondary sanctions by selected developing countries. At the very least, they cannot hope that, of, that there will be that much of support by these countries if China threatens these countries simultaneously and asks them to choose sides. Uh, last but not least, obviously we have all heard about Chinese investment in um, infrastructure capacities around the world. Now, that would obviously be some of the worst scenarios, but uh, China can have the capacity to at least temporarily cause slowdowns, distortions uh, in a much greater extent or in much greater number of important choke points of global economy than Russia can dream to be capable of. So uh, probably we should uh, now follow rather closely how China seems to be prepared. They seem to try to disconnect from global economy. They seem to reduce their dependence on external flows. Maybe that could be inspiration for some of us. But it, as I said before in the previous question, it's unlikely that we would succeed in that completely. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you both. Um, uh, we will have to see what the future brings. Uh, unfortunately, our time is almost up, so our discussion has come to an end. So uh, let me thank you both, uh, Vatana Besan and uh, Professor Semerak, for being here with us and for sharing your perspective on today's topic. Let's hope that the war in Ukraine will end soon and that in case of Taiwan, it won't even start. And I wish you both a very nice day. Thank you very much for interesting discussion. Thank you very much. You too. I would also like to thank our listeners for staying with us until the end. And I wish you as well a pleasant rest of the day.